So an overview of what I'm gonna talk about is how does endometriosis cause pain? Because we can't treat it if we don't know uh, how the pain is caused. I'll talk about the goals of treatment, what the treatment options are, and then some new directions in research. So within the lesions, there is an excess of estrogen, um, which the estrogen promotes crosstalk between all of the different lesions. Um, and um, there is also increased aromatase um, activity within the lesions, which is not the case for normal endometrium and increased PGE2 in the implants, which also increases the estrogen. Um, there's also relative progesterone resistance. So within the implants, there uh, is a decreased number of receptors of progesterone. We know that estrogen, I mean, I'm sorry, that progesterone can um, change your estradiol over to estrone, which is a less active uh, form of estrogen. So, but I think the most important thing to talk about is the exaggerated inflammatory response. So, um, we know the most common theory of how endometriosis is caused is by reflux of um, endometrial cells. When this happens, this uh, stimulates a, um, an inflammatory response. Um, you have an increase in inflammatory cells like COX-2, macrophages, cytokines, um, even vascular endothelial growth factor, nerve growth factor. And so all of these are important to um, allowing the lesion to grow um, and then cause pain. Um, so the problem is that uh, with this inflammation uh, and the lesions, which are generally associated with nerves, you have um, a continuous noxious um, stimuli and then with time, that can cause a peripheral nerve sensitization, which increases the patient's perception of pain. Um, and then with chronic peripheral nerve sensitization, you can actually have central nerve sensitization, um, which can cause the chronic pain syndromes um, and actually can change some of the gray matter in the brain. So um, one of the things we're finding is that with the central nerve sensitization, if we've made it to that point, Surgery is not as helpful. So our goal in treating uh, endometriosis medically uh, is to decrease the pain and uh, slow the progression, if we can, of the endometriosis. Um, we should empirically treat, uh, even if we don't have a diagnosis, we haven't done our saliva test or our ultrasound or MRI or uh, laparoscopy, we need to treat it right away to help decrease um, the peripheral nerve sensitization and the, um, then leading to the central sensitization. Um, it should be considered suppressive rather than curative, which is important when talking to patients and setting appropriate expectations. Um, and then we should also treat after surgery to prevent or at least slow the recurrence. Um, we know that uh, the vast majority of women will have recurrence um, after surgery within five years. Uh, so these are the medications I'm gonna talk about today. Um, most of them are hormonally acting. Uh, we do have the NSAIDs at the top. Um, so your ibuprofen, Motrin, that sort of thing. Um, the, while it seems that it would be really helpful, it counteracts the COX-2 that we talked about has um, increased in the lesions. Um, there's actually not a lot of great research um, to say that NSAIDs actually work. The other thing to notice is that the vast majority of these things uh, inhibit fertility. So these are excellent options for someone who uh, has endometriosis but doesn't plan to get pregnant in the near future. Um, but when a patient's wanting fertility, this makes it really hard to treat. So um, what has traditionally been known as the first line treatment is your combined hormonal contraceptive. So this is your combined estrogen and progesterone. Uh, the way that they work is they inhibit the ovaries, uh, which decreases ovarian formation of estrogen, um, but then it can also decidualize or atrophy the lesions, just very much like it does the endometrial lining. 
Um, this comes in multiple different forms, the pills, the patch, and the ring, and there are actually several studies showing that any of the three of those uh, are the same as far as efficacy. Um, one thing to remember, because this is uh, an environment of excess estrogen, the lower you can keep your estrogen level in your um, combined hormonal contraceptive, the better. Um, and then uh, continuous fashion is best. Um, this is what, I don't know exactly how you all call it, uh, where you're from, but this is where we skip the placebo week um, and therefore have amenorrhea. So uh, benefits is they're super easy to use for the patients. They're inexpensive. Um, they do slow the progression of the endometriosis. Um, and there's tons of different options. I don't know about here, but there are hundreds of different oral contraceptives to choose from in the US. Of course, the downside we have to think about is uh, venous thromboembolism, um, of course, makes it hard to get pregnant when you're on a contraceptive. Um, and then as soon as women stop taking these, there tends to be very quick recurrence. And then of course, anyone who has a contraindication to estrogen cannot use these. So next I'll talk about the different progestins. There are lots of different options for these. Um, I actually love the Northendrone in the US, Agestin is the brand name. Um, this Dynagest is not in the US, um, but the research is excellent on it. Um, and so these two progestins actually um, have similar efficacy to the combined hormonal contraceptives. Um, and, um, and so actually can be considered first line treatments. Um, one other side note is, um, that norethadrone acetate, um, is the pro drug to a Justin and, um, that's the mini pill. I saw some advertisements over here for the, um, micro Justin pill. Um, it has not been proven to be quite as effective as the Agestin. Um, side effects uh, for the norethindrone weight gain um, is a big one. Um, it tends to make patients hungry, and so I definitely counsel my patients about that. Um, on the Dynagest, again, the research is incredible for this medication. Um, in addition to um, the normal progestin fighting the, the estrogen, it also is anti-inflammatory, anti-angiogenic, and anti-proliferative, which is really important. So another progestin is the Madrex, sorry, medroxyprogesterone um, or Provera is what we call it in the U.S. Um, there are oral forms, um, but there's in research and really in my clinical practice as well, there's varying degree of improvement in pain with these. However, the IM form, we call it Depo-Provera, uh, has shown to be really effective, like as effective as your GRNH agonist. Um, this is a shot they have to come into the clinic and get every three months. Weight gain is another problem with this one. Um, and then long term, they can have bone loss. Okay, so your long term options, which of course are easier for the patient, not something they have to remember to do or come into the clinic every three months. You've got your levonorgestrel um, IUDs, which in the US are Mirena, Kylina, I'm not sure what the name brands are here. Um, but they, cause endometrial atrophy. Um, they allow progesterone into the peritoneal cavity, um, which can help fight the excess estrogen. Um, and they also decrease the retrograde flow, um, which in theory should decrease the um, endometriosis lesions. Um, there are multiple studies showing that placing an IUD after surgery can um, decrease the recurrence rate. And the edonogestrel implant, we call it the next one on, um, goes in the arm good for three years, um, has improved dysmenorrhea. Um, I have seen this time and time again in my patients. The downside is the irregular menses. So some women will have no periods at all. Some women have just a few a year, but there are some women that will have light bleeding two weeks out of every single month. And of course, that's not a, not a side effect that most women are willing to accept. I will say I've had multiple patients over the years that say, I don't care that I'm bleeding every day, my pain is better. Uh, and so they're okay with it. 
So then next are the uh, GnRH agonists. So uh, this upregulates um, estrogen in the beginning. And so patients will get an initial flare of pain and symptoms, but then with time, um, it essentially blocks the ovarian estrogen. Um, there are um, IM form, which is most used in the US, the Luprolide, but there's also um, the Gosselin and the Nacolin. Um, so the benefits are, this is the one that has been proven to cause regression uh, of endometriosis. The problem is the amount of side effects. So um, it creates a very hypoestrogenic state. So you, you know, bone loss, vaginal atrophy, hot flashes, um, and it's very expensive and hard for us to um, get approved in the US for our patients. Um, it does, um, it's only approved in the US for uh, six months of use unless you use ADBAC. Um, so a Justin five milligrams or the North End drone is um, one of my favorites, but you can also use the combined hormonal contraceptives. Um, then you have the androgenic steroids, which um, are, I think previously were kind of a mainstay. This is the Danazol. Um, it inhibits the GnRH and then um, it also acts locally to inhibit the growth factor um, and inhibits um, the estrogenic enzymes that lead to increased estrogen. Um, it is very effective shown in study after study, but a lot of women are unwilling to take the side effects of the hair loss and the acne and the male growth pattern um, hair. So it has kind of fallen out of favor. So next is the aromatase inhibitors, um, which were looking really promising. Um, you've got the anastrozole, the letrozole. Um, these prevent estrogen production in the actual lesions, um, but also in the periphery and the ovaries. So we know that uh, postmenopausal women um, only create, or um, yeah, only create estrogen within their um, periphery. So this is really helpful because it specifically hits that. The downside is a lot of women get follicular cysts and bone loss with it. Um, and so you kind of have to have them on a, um, a combined hormonal contraceptive with this to help prevent those cysts. The other thing is that there are some more recent studies that are coming out that are showing um, conflicting data as to whether these are actually as effective as we once thought. So this is um, some of the newer research, uh, the GRNH antagonists. Um, there are multiple trials that are showing that these are very effective. Um, still working on what's the best dose, what's the best duration, how long is it safe? Um, do we have to have ADVAC, how much ADVAC, things like that. Um, but there are several trials coming out that are um, looking really good with uh, the ADVAC therapy. Um, the other thing that the studies are showing is that the higher the dose you use, the better the pain control, but the worse the side effects. Um, and so finding that perfect um, amount of um, pain control with less side effects. Um, their um, hot flashes, the bone density decrease, things like that, just like your agonist, but it's not nearly as hypoestrogenic and you don't get that initial flare. Um, and there are several phase three trials going on to get these um, around the world to get these officially approved as treatment for endometriosis. The last one I'm going to talk about is the uh, selective progesterone receptor modulators, which was another one that was looking really promising. Um, they um, work by decreasing the blood flow to the endometrium and then um, also decrease the COX-2, but that's only been shown in animal studies. So um, there are very, very limited human studies, and most of them are from several years ago. Um, but there were several that showed that mifepristone, um, five milligrams plus surgery, um, showed lower recurrence rate and higher pregnancy rates. Um, the biggest problem I'm finding with this one is that I'm, I'm not finding um, any current research going on. Um, and so we need some human study research in this one. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate you.